Well, welcome everyone to um, the first of our plant identification talks. Um, we've had a great series of talks from Margaret, and I hope you feel inspired to find out more about plants in general, and especially about the plants in Upper Teesdale. Now, we're now looking towards the outdoors and the field trips that are coming up. And normally we will be doing some, oh, hang on, some practical work in the hall in Middleton and Teesdale. And I can't get my screen to move, hang on a minute. Tricia. Press the right arrow, okay. I'm trusting it. Oh, it's, it was just stuck. Um, no, well, we're okay. Okay, so basically we would normally be having a couple of practical sessions in the Middleton and Teesdale hall, but obviously this year we're not doing that. So I've tried to find a way to do a kind of practical on Zoom. So we'll see how we, how we get along with it. But if you do feel inspired to come out and learn more about the plants, there's a number of ways you can do this. And obviously the most important one is to get out into the fields with other botanists. And we are very lucky that we've got Margaret to go out with on a Monday night and she's trained quite a few botanists to go with us now. So when we start our field work, you've got a great chance to learn from others. So I hope some of you are able to take that opportunity up. But wherever you are, when you go out Hang into on. the field to learn about plants, you need to make records, nothing complicated, just simple little drawings of what you see, trying to label them as you learn new facts about the plants as you develop your botany. Obviously, photographs are a great way to do it. I don't find photographs that useful if I haven't actually seen the plant unless you get lots of different angles and, you know, lots of notes to go with them. And one thing Margaret taught me ages ago was to get labelled specimens, get your specimens out of the garden or out of the waste ground beside your house, nowhere like Upper Teesdale or anywhere special, but just things that you, are common or garden weeds and put little sticky labels on them, learn to identify them and practice at home. A really good way to learn about your plants. Mm, interesting. And another very low volume. Can you hear? Can you hear? Is there yes. a problem with volume? Yeah. No. I think I think the problem is some people don't have not muted themselves, so we can hear them talking to one another. Oh, can everybody mute, please? I've got a bit of a problem with my voice at the minute, anyway. So, um, but let me know if you can't hear. Is that better? Always. Yeah. Is everybody muted? Uh, uh, my Lizzie, you're perfect. We can hear you fine. Just okay. don't, you don't need to shout. Okay. If everybody can make quite sure that you are on mute, please. Um, it's, it's often the new people who join that they don't mute as they join. Um, that's it. Everybody's now muted. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. OK, so what we're going to talk about tonight really is a bit of our personal study and practice, um, looking at observing the plants, improving our observational skills. I'm going to give you some botanical terms to learn. And most of all tonight, I want you to appreciate how much the main parts of a flower vary in different species, because this is one of the key things to help you to differentiate one group of plants from another. I'm not going to go into the classification tonight. There's too much there and it would be too confusing. I want to keep it quite simple tonight and start with very basic things, which I've sent you all uh, a copy of the flower structure and some notes. And then we'll develop, the, as we go through the talk, you know, some things might seem too much to learn tonight, and that's fine. You just pick up what you can and then stop when you feel you've got too much information. Because there's quite a lot of people on tonight who have a lot of botany, so I'm trying to address everyone's interests as well. So um, I've just put a little sketch up here of a plant, uh, which I've sent to you as well. And this is the kind of sketch you might want to make when you're out in the field. Now, although I'm going to talk just about flowers tonight, obviously the other parts of the plant are also really important when you're identifying. But, you know, I've got to start somewhere and the flowers are the most straightforward place to start. But you need to look at other things like leaves and so on and how they're arranged. But we should also be aware really of the basic arrangement in a plant. It's obviously got roots, it's got leaves to photosynthesize, 
But the way the leaves are arranged is important. And we may come back to that when you're out in the field. Often you get a stipule, a little structure at the base of the leaf there, and that sometimes helps identify. You've got your flowers, and at the base of the flower, you have a little bract. So I'm just kind of saying, you know, this is what the whole plant's like. But tonight we're going to talk about the flower. Now, this is just a random plan of a flower that I drew to show all the main parts. And what you have to think about with the flowers is, that, you know, like all living organisms, the plant's key job is to get its genetic blueprint from one generation to the next. Uh, that, that genetic blueprint, in the case of the plants, is in the pollen grains here, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, in the anthers, and it's in the ovaries. And so the plant invests a huge amount of energy into making really interesting and ad well-adapted flowers, which are going to suit their method of pollination. And that invests lots of energy in the pigments, in the patterns, in the size of the petals, and so on. All of these things are important because the plant's investing a lot of energy in attracting um, the pollinators to get its genes passed on to the next generation during pollination and fertilization. And that's just like any other living organism. But of course, the diversity um, of the plant species in doing this is just remarkable. And um, we're going to have a little look at some of these adaptations tonight. But let's just start here, <coughs> excuse me, and have a look at the main parts of a plant, the flower, sorry. So you've got the peduncle or the flower stalk at the bottom here, and you've got the sepal, which usually surrounds the petal as it's developing in the flower bud. You've got the petals, which um, are co collectively called a corolla. <clears throat> That's got markings, usually your colors on, if it's insects pollinated. And that's really what we're mainly looking at tonight. And then you've got, so you've got this ring of petals here. Then you've got the male stamen, long filament, and these anthers on the end, which make and contain the pollen. Now, the pollen present in the anthers is quite sticky in the insect pollinated uh, plants because it needs to stick onto the insect's legs and fur to get passed on. If it was an insect pollinated grass or something, it would have very light pollen to get carried in the wind. So that together, the anther and the filament make up the male stamen. And then we've got the female part, which is called, collectively called the carpal. That's the stigma, the style, and the ovary. Now the stigma is the receptive surface for the pollen. And it has a sugary substance uh, which it secretes on the top surface of the um, stigma here. And that causes the pollen grains to swell up when they land there and they grow tubes, germinate tubes. Oh, I keep losing my cursor here. Oh, lost my cursor, it's gone away. Keeps telling me I'm sharing the screen and then losing the cursor. Well, I've lost it at the minute. But basically, the pollen grain goes down the style, grows down the pollen grain, sorry, the pollen grain tube grows down the style, down here, and one of the nuclei will fertilize one of these ovules. And then it will develop into a seed, hopefully. And that's a whole different story about seed dispersal. So I've given you, um, for some reason, this is sticking. For some reason, I've, uh, I've given you this um, table, which I'm not going to go through now, because you've got that already, but I have put it onto this diagram. So I've just annotated this photograph with the same notes as were in that table. And this is to show you a real flower rather than the diagram I just gave you. So up there is a little flower bud with sepals on. Now, the sepals are collectively called the calyx. I'm sorry about all of these words that all seem to begin with S and C, which is very confusing when you're first learning them, but the sepals there are on that little flower bud at the top. And then we've got the petals over here called the corolla. <clears throat> and the carpal, 
Now you can see this, this is a three lobed stigma. The style is very short, and then you've got this fat little ovary. I think they're gorgeous flowers, these. And I hope the experienced botanists are identifying what they are. Um, <clears throat> so you've got stigma, style, and ovary, like I showed you in the, in the drawing. And it again explains what I've already showed you. So I'm not going to go through that again. But there you've got your stigma, where the pollen lands, style, and the ovary. And you've got your male stamens here, which are quite, they're called versatile, they're quite wobbly. Oh, sorry. They're quite wobbly and they move around so that the um, anthers can rotate and the pollen can drop onto the insects more easily. Um, I was going to say something else there as well, I've forgotten. Gone. It'll come back in a minute. Um, okay, so that's just showing you those. Um, important part of the flower on a real flower, because it's quite different looking at a drawing and looking at the real thing. Now that's your homework. There's another flower. Can you see those same things on that flower? Hopefully by the end of this evening, you'll have more idea, because already you can see how different this central part of the flower is compared to the um, one I've just shown you. Look at the difference there in that central stigma and ovary to that one. So maybe it's next week, we can, if you're not sure, we can talk through that once you've had a look at it yourself. Um, again, the more experienced people should be able to identify that species, especially when I show you the, the leaves that go with it. That's the garlic mustard, Allioaria petiolata. Okay, now, the thing is that um, flowers look so different, even though you, all the little white ones might look similar to you when you first start off. There's so much variation, and that variation can be in the sepals, those outer protective structures. It can be the number, the color, the shape, or the hairy or smooth, and how they're arranged. You know, are they fused, are they in a tube, and so on. Similarly, the petals, the number of petals, their color, their shape, their size, all of these things can vary. The carpal, remember that's the female part, stigma, style, and ovary, and that can look so different, even on that, those two flowers I've just shown you. The carpal was so different in that second flower to the first one, I think. Um, stamens, they can vary in the number, the length of the filament, sorry, I spelled that wrongly there. Um, the size of the anther and how it's attached, that's also interesting, and the colour of the pollen. Okay, so we're going to have a look at each of those different structures. And what I thought I would do, I should have said this at the beginning, unless Trisha thinks it's a bad idea. Um, I thought I would stop after every section. Um, and you can just either ask questions or Trisha can maybe post them up. And Trisha could um, let me know if there's anything you want clarifying before I go on. Because it's not like a normal talk. I'm trying to show you things and teach you things. So I'd rather you ask me if you didn't understand anything as we um, went through. So if you've got a question, if you post it to Tricia, she'll bring it. Is that okay, Tricia? Are you there? Yeah, that should be, yeah I'm here. It's, oh, sorry, okay. inter <laughs> internet is going very slow today at the moment. Uh, um, so if people want to put their hands up or post it in chat or or whatever, um, and then we will, or raise your hand. And so when we, oh, Claire Taylor's left. Um, so whatever yeah. me method that people would like to ask, um, that will be brilliant. But just remember to unmute if you're wanting to ask a question. Um, and if we can, so have you come to the end now, Lizzie? So that's the first section. Anybody got any questions before I go on to settles? No. Right. Okay. Can we all mute again, please? So the sepals are collectively called the calyx, and they can vary a great deal. So here they are labeled with that blue arrow. Now these ones alternate the petals, and uh, the number is important. There are five here. This is a member of the, the rose family. Um, some of you recognize it. It's a um, false strawberry. Um, and the sepals can be free like these ones. They can be fused into a tube. 
They can have different colors. They can be hairy or glabrous. That means smooth. They might not even be there in the mature flower. They might be present, they might not. And there's something called tepals or sepals, which I'll come to in a minute. So let's have a look at how the sepals can vary. Well, on this plant, which I'm sure you all recognize is the forget-me-not, the sepals are really important because um, <clears throat> there are two main groups of forget-me-nots. It's a kind of unofficial division, but the water forget-me-nots have quite flat hairs on the calyx here. But these ones, if you see, they're quite hooked and, and they're like bristles, the kind of are called patent, they kind of stick outwards. And that's characteristic of things like the field forget-me-not and the wood forget-me-not. So it's very useful to look at the um, hairs on the sepals. And notice as well, of course, that that sepal tube is fused at the base. So it's not completely separate like the one I showed you before. Okay, so that's the first thing, the hooked hairs. And now in this one, which is um, one of the lotus flowers, the birds for trefoils, you can see that the tube is fused. Now, in actual fact, um, there's five, there's a sepal tube, but there's a gap, a wider gap between two of the sepal teeth, and that's diagnostic for separating um, the birds for trefoil from, I think it's, the great trefoil, the bigger one, lotus um, pedunculatus. So there's a, the sepal tube is important um, just to recognize that it, it gives its separate uh, feature already, but it can be really quite diagnostic with some species. Um, for example, here you've got this gap and that helps you to know, that tells you that it, this is lotus corniculatus, the birds for trefoil as opposed to another one, which is very similar, but doesn't have that same arrangement with the sepal teeth. Now, this one, I'm sure you all recognize as a poppy. And you can see here in the bud, there are sepals, but in the adult, there aren't any. And this can be quite confusing when you're starting to look at um, plants that have, uh, that have neither sepals nor petals, but something called tepals. <laughs> which um, I'll come on to in a minute, but I'm just, all I'm pointing out here is that most plants have sepals, but um, they might lose them hey, when they develop. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> the sepals are the sorry. sepals, the sepals in poppies, which are wrapping around the bud, drop yeah. off as the, as the flower opens. That's right, Margaret, that's what I'm saying. So I've said- oh, I'm I've, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> I'm just saying here, where's the settle gone with the question mark? But um, yeah, what I was saying was that sometimes it can be confusing with other plants because they have another structure called a tepal, which I'll come on to. Anyway, the main thing to understand here is that the settles surround the bud, but the drop off in the parent, in the uh, mature flower. Probably because it's such an enormous petal. Nothing gone wrong with the sound. And it's crinkled um, and it unfolds itself. It probably uh, just pushes the sepals off. <clears throat> um, can everyone hear still? Is there something wrong with the sound? Is that okay? No, it sounds fine, yeah. Lizzie. You're doing brilliant. So, Tom and Till um, is another member of the rose family. Interestingly, um, it's got four petals. But the reason why I've got it on here is because I'm showing you the sepals and these are the ovaries at the base. But when I turn it over, sorry, when I go to the next one, the petals have gone, but you can see that um, we have another structure in between the sepals here. So you have like an extra ring of usually narrower sepal-like structures called epicepals. So if we turn, if we look at the even there, that's got the same thing. At the back of here, it's got actually both sepals and epicepals, which you can see on here. So I'm going to go back to the other one in a minute, but see there, that's the sepal, but you've also got epicepals. Now you might think, so what? But actually they're really important when you're identifying um, for example, the rose family from other families. 
because not um, many of the families have epicephals. So just go back again. We're saying that um, although you can't see you can't see them on there because they're alternating with the petals. And if I'd known, I would have actually turned it upside down, which is what you need to do to see the, the um, epicephals. But because it's lost its petals there, you can see the epicephals behind on that one quite nicely. So tormentilla grows all over the place around in uh, Teasdale. So have a look out for that. And you'll see that extra ring around the back of the sepals. And there it is again in this flower, which is the water even, and you can see the sepals there and then the epicephals. So lovely flowers, the what's the water even. Okay. And sometimes to make things more complicated, um, the outer sepals are the same color as the flower. And they're sometimes described as petaloid sepals, but please don't worry about that if you're just learning. Just think about them as coloured sepals. And inside, you've got the petals when they unfurl, and these are the sepals then on the outside. So what I'm saying here is sometimes the sepals are the same colour as the flower, and they're quite hard to tell apart. This is the columbine, which shows that quite nicely. I often take photographs of plants in the garden rather than using wild ones when I'm showing flower structure because A, I've got them in my garden and B, I don't want to pick wild flowers. So, so there you go. So here you've got this colored sepals, which you can see in the bud. I'm trying to get me closer back. In that one, there they are. There, and then they're just here, almost the same color as the petals when they come out. Now, at the moment, there's quite a few flowers going to come out in the buttercup family, and I'm um, maybe realize how many of them don't behave like they should, and they've all got different flower arrangements. So I'm sure you recognize this flower with its rather characteristic um, flower leaves here. This is the marsh marigold, and you might think these are petals, but they're not. They're actually sepals. They're yellow sepals. And there, there aren't any petals at all in the marsh marigold. So, I mean, this is really more for interest because, you know, you can, you can identify the marsh marigold by looking at the yellow colour and the shape of the leaves. But it's just to let you realise that there's quite a few differences in the way the sepals and petals are arranged. And I'm sure you reckon, recognise this other flower from Teasdale and North Pennines. This is the Trollius, the king glow flower glow flower and again the sepals are yellow but this time if i had a photograph which i haven't inside the um flower you would see that the petals have been turned into tiny nectaries which is something that happens in quite a few of the flowers in the buttercup family sorry like the um christmas rose and the hellebores so if you want to go and have a look at um, a nice big example of a um, of plant where the petals have been modified into nectaries, have a look at the hellebores that are out at the moment. I don't know why I haven't put one in, actually. Right, so the last one is that in the lily family, especially in all of the what we call the monocots, the flowers there all have the same colour. And they usually look very similar. And um, that's because the sepals and petals all look the same and are called tepals, okay? And while we're looking at this flower here, they're really nice flowers to look at flower structure. If you've got any lilies, or someone's bought you a bunch of flowers, there's a lily in them, don't throw it out, dissect it, and have a look at the um, nice structures of the flower parts inside it. Now, this is just for interest, really. Um, the snowdrop also has two rings of tepals, and it's really hard to explain that they're supposed to look the same when they quite obviously don't, but their origins are the same. They all originate as um, sepals and petals, undifferentiated, so they're tepals. So that's just for interest. I don't worry too much about that one. It's just they're out just now, and they're nice to look at. 
Okay, any questions about sepals? Or shall we carry on to petals? Okay, right, so again, they can vary in their symmetry, which I'll show you in a minute. Number, color, and so on. So let's have a look. So this flower, which you saw before, is called, it's said to have radial symmetry. That's because it's like a cake. You could cut it in half anywhere and you get two equal halves. So it's called radial symmetry because anywhere you cut it in half, you get two matching halves. I think that's the simplest way to describe it. And its proper name is called actinomorphic. Um, there's another example. That's a wood even. No, it's not, sorry. It's a, um, I'll tell you what it is in a minute because I'm going to ask you the question in a minute. So that also shows radial symmetry. And this shows bilateral symmetry. This I'm sure you recognize is a, um, a juga, the bugle. And if you cut the flower that, the petal flower that way, you'll get two equal halves on there and there. But if you cut it that way, you don't get two halves that are the same. So in bilateral symmetry, they're symmetrical in that plane, but not that plane. So it's not like a cake, you can't cut it in different angles and get the same two halves. And the bilaterally symmetrical flowers tend to be more advanced and um, highly adapted for pollination in my experience. <clears throat> and that flower there is just very nice characteristic arrangement of the ajuga flower, the bugle flower, which I'll come back to. So two types of symmetry in the flower structure, primarily down to the petals arrangement. Now the number of petals matters, and you know you can count the number of petals up, one, two, three, four, five on there, one, two, three, four, five, quite easily, even though they've got that little cut in them, which is there, with the division, which is described as bifid. Now, if you look at this one though, this one, how many petals do you think we've got here? In actual fact, this is also just divided. There's the petal there, there's one there, and so on. But these petals, oh, sorry, dear, <laughs> these petals, um, are much more deeply divided. And that's what you have to be careful about because if you're counting the petals on there, if you're not careful, you'll count 10 instead of five. So you have to look carefully to see how far down that division goes in the um, petal. So when they're divided like that, they're called bifid. And of course, if you think about something like ragged robin, they're much more divided up um, than just into the... Uh, two divisions for each petal. Now, sometimes it's the shape of the petals. So this, these petals have this characteristic broad petal shape there, but they're narrow at the base like that. And um, again, there are five, but very different from the white flower we've just looked at. And I'm sure some of you recognize that flower. The leaves on the right should give you a clue. So those more experienced people, I'm sure recognize that as um, now called Sabulina verna, was Minuatia verna, the spring sandwich. Um, sometimes the petals are overlapping. Showed you this photograph before to show you the tepals, but here I'm showing you how the petals overlap each other. They're not fused although the sometimes can be, but not in this flower. They're just overlapping. Um, you often get flower guides on, nectar guides on. And if you can work out the leaves in the background, sure you can see this is the wood sorrel, oxalis, um, with this lovely venation on the petals. So the insect comes along and gets guided straight down into the flower there. Now, I'm coming back to the center of this flower in a minute. I'm just showing it here for the nectar guides because you can imagine if you're a bee flying above or an insect, you really guide it down to the middle of the flower, aren't you, with those fantastic um, patterns on the petals of the geranium. I've just put this in because um, <laughs> it's such an interesting flower and um, it's got these different faces. Um, this is a doxa Moscatelina, the town, sometimes called the town hall clock for obvious reasons. So this has got a flower 
on all sides. So another, another arrangement. <clears throat> and before we leave the, um, the petals, I just thought you might be interested in these three flowers here. They're all related. And I was thinking that the more experienced botanists would recognize, we know this is the water raven, and this is the wood raven. Notice it's lovely pointed sepals there. And then this is, of course, the hybrid between the two. So just showing how um, that's something else to be aware of, that you sometimes get these crosses between the parents. So you've got the water raven, the wood raven, and the hybrid, which looks much more in shape like the water raven, but the colour, of course, is like the wood raven. Um, zygomorphic flowers, why am I showing you that? Oh yeah, just to show the arrangement. Yeah, on this one, um, this is time, and here you see the upper, petal structure here, the two side structures here, and this is where the lip where the insects land and go down into the tube of the flower, because this has got a calyx tube, calyx tube and the base of the petal tube is fused. So just showing you another arrangement there of the petals. And um, the more sophisticated, highly adapted plants, flowers for um, insect pollination have these really fantastic flowers. And this is the um, broom showing the, uh, sorry, I should, I should have, the stand, oh, sorry, the standard at the top. I was trying to move this thing off my uh, screen. I've got a conversation on the screen here. And then I've got the wings here and the keel is in between the two. So um, the insect lands, down here and the hood comes over as it goes down into the flower to get its nectar and aid the pollination unknowingly as it does its nectar collecting. So just another adaptation of the flower to show you. We're not getting too bogged down in, you know, what all the flowers are, their species are called. Um, it's just about seeing how they can vary in their arrangements. Any questions about that before I leave it? Okay, so the stamens, which um, again, the number can vary. They can have two rings called whorls, an inner whorl or an outer whorl or just one. The stamens can be different lengths. Um, and very interestingly, the stamens can be fused together, either through the filaments, stalks or the anthers or both. And sometimes they're attached to the petals or other parts of the flower. So this is, you know, they're quite important when you're identifying some species. So you need to increase your observation of what's going on with the stamens. Now this one's quite a typical sort of easy one. Uh, this is a, a wood anemone, another member of the buttercup family. And you can see lots of um, stamens here. And uh, also incidentally, lots of little, lovely little carpels in the middle. So just a very um, basic arrangement of all of the stamens attaching to the center of the flower, lots of anthers, and they just, uh, when the insects land on the flower, they'll just, pollen will get dispersed onto the insects and off it goes. There it is, wood anemone. Now this flower, um, is the speed well, and I'll put it in to show you its stamens because it's such a beautiful flower, I think. And it's got this lovely bluish pollen and only two stamens here. And then these little, uh, only two, yeah, and little anthers at the top with this kind of bluish pollen. This is the stigma in the middle. Now, interestingly enough, in actual fact, the speed well flower, um, is you, do, you don't very often use the flower in identification. It's sometimes used for color, which I don't find that straightforward and a little bit about the, the white on it. But when you come to speed wells, you really need to um, be looking at other parts of the plant, which will come onto when we get out into the field. 
it's just always worth putting a photograph of a speed dweller because they're so beautiful and they've got such lovely stamens. And the more experienced among you should recognize this um, plant. This has got the hairs going all the way around, even though they don't look as if they are there. They are going all the way around, and this is the wood speed well. <clears throat> now, the uh, white dead nettle has a very complicated um, structure. The dead nettle family have got really quite complex flowers. They're very beautiful and interesting. And um, here's the one on its side to show you its arrangement. I know we're looking here mainly at the stamens, but it's got this lovely lip here and tiny projections and then this big hood. And look at all those lovely crenellations and hairs on the top. It's a really fabulous flower. And there's the calyx, look, uh, with its pointed teeth. Both very useful in identifying in the dead nettle family. And in this one, it's just a better view of it. Um, you can see the stamens, it's two pairs, and they're right inside the top of the um, flower there. And um, they go right down to the base. And I'll show you in a minute what they look like when you dissect them out of the flower. So obviously when the insect goes in, this hood comes down, pollen goes on from here. And this is the dissection of the um, flower I did a while ago. And that shows you, see there's, look how long they are. All these long um, stamens with these lovely furry sort of anthers. Anybody recognize this flower? It doesn't really go wild up north. I don't even, it probably goes wild in the chalk in the south. Um, this is rosemary. And these anthers just are quite remarkable how they hang over at the top. See them coming up with curves around. It's just such a lovely flower, the rosemary flower. Um, okay, so this one shows you um, how the anthers are attached in the borage family. This is pulmonaria, the um, lungwort. And these are the flowers just taken out of it there. So I'm showing you, I've cut one in half. And in the lung work, you can see the anthers are attached just there, at the top of the tube, because the insect's going to come down that tube to the bottom. And of course, the anthers will brush their pollen as it goes down. They have extremely, I don't even know if they've got any kind of filament at all, but they're attached directly onto the um, petal, probably by a tiny filament. This is um, borage, I think. And again, it's not a very good photograph, sorry. I was trying to uh, magnify it. It, these are um, anthers stuck around the ring. I think it's borage family there. Very similar idea to that. I just thought it showed you, you know, a bit more detail there. I thought I had another one on. Oh no, it's all right, it's at the end, sorry. So that's the, um, the, the stamens. Any questions about the stamens? Everybody happy? It's really weird when I can't see anybody and I'm getting silence. I know that's, what I want, so I can tell you, but it feels we're, very... We're stiff. happy, Lucy. <laughs> Not getting any interaction. <laughs> I feel like Billy no mates. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're Somebody here. was asking a here. question there, but I think they probably just need to unmute and speak up. Go on then, carry on, unmute. I'll just realize Not that. me, somebody else. Oh, okay, carry on. Anybody, anybody want to ask a question? Well, do it at the end then, don't worry. Well, I had to... Sorry, um, um, I had a question earlier on, but um, you went, uh, you, you, you moved on to other things before I could um, ask it. Uh, you showed examples of uh, flowers where the sepals and the petals are basically identical, forming tepals, or also um, flowers where there are no petals, only sepals, which look yes. like petals. <laughs> right, so I was wondering, how do you tell a sepal from a petal in these circumstances? That's a really good question. <laughs> And actually, um, I find I, I'm going to go back. I only know, um, and I'll take me a second to go back soon. Uh, yeah. Um, the thing is that in this, I only really know because the tepals tend to be in the lily family. I mean, Margaret might want to add in a minute, but basically, um, the, uh, from, um, from the embryology, I'm guessing, 
um, the sepals develop differently to the petals. So because of the uh, way in which they develop it originally, um, we know that they are actually sepals. Um, but in terms of the tepals, um, again, the, it'll be something to do with the embryology, but you, it's in the lily family where they're generally found. And if you actually look at a lily, you can see there is a slight difference between the inner and outer rings. And I think it's, quite, it's a really good question because it's quite an arbitrary division in many ways. Margaret, do you want to add anything there on that? Maybe we'll ask at the end. We'll come back at the end. And um, sorry, what's your, who is? Yes, who's, uh, uh, yes my name is Robert Poltvig. Thank you very much for- oh, No, Robert, for we'll come back to it at the end. Thank you. When we can maybe discuss it with Margaret and she might have um, a better explanation than me on that. But it's a very good question. And the only reason I can tell the difference is because I know which families have which when you're looking at them, you know? Um, do, you want, do you want me to come in now? Yes, please, Margaret, yes. On tepals. On tepals, um, how you tell them from... Um, I, I, think, I, I think the gentleman's right that um, you start off with the embryology of the developing flower. Yes. And uh, the flower parts are, both, are arranged in rings, what we call whorls. And so I don't know what the exact situation is in uh, Lake, in King Cup, Marsh Marigold. Um, one would really need to see the early development of the flower are you sure it doesn't have any nectaries no i checked this margaret because um okay right. yeah because I, I was I, surprised <laughs> i don't know but a lot of the buttercup family the even in a buttercup the very bait <coughs> the very pace of the true petals true petals because you've got sepals as well an outer ring of green leaves uh, and then the next inner ring of petals in buttercup but at the very base of a buttercup you find a tiny little lip and in between the main part of the petal and the lip is where you've got the nectar secreted right yes so when you get to something like globe flowers and you look inside the yellow outer leaves that you're looking at in the flower, you can find the nectaries that look like little trumpets. You know, they look yeah. like little trumpets. Yes, they do. And so you've got that ring of nectaries there which are um, developed from the petals. They've lost the big showy bit. So you can think, well, what are these things outside? And they are, in fact, modified uh, sepals. And quite yes. a number of the buttercup family, if you look carefully, you find the nectaries in the middle. And you work out that the outer ring must be sepals. But think of the development, the structure of what I might call the basic flower. And you've got a ring of sepals. And then on the central stalk, known as the receptacle, receptacle, sorry, uh, the next ring, which we call a whorl, W-H-O-R-L, is petals. And then if you go internally, you've got one or more rings of sepals. But when you get in the very center, if you've got something like buttercup, you've got actually a whole lot of rings. They become a spiral in the middle. Um, 
some plants, if you look at them in bud, you can see that spiral arrangement of the carpels. Uh, in something like the uh, stitchwork flowers, it, oh, am I right on that? Yeah, the stitchwork flower that was shown, the ring of carpels have been fused together and they form a little sphere. Um, I hope that's helpful. That was very helpful, Marcus. Thank you. And um, Thank you very much. I will check again about the, um, but I did look it up because I was surprised that it didn't have any, uh, it said it's just got one wool. But anyway, we can have a look later. Um, okay, so the gynecium, which I've spelt wrong, that should be an E, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, so it's G-Y-N-O-E, sorry about that there. Lizzie, I'll come back to one thing. And when you showed the flower of the lilies. Yes. Which are monocots, and you mentioned that. Yes. The parts of the flowers in monocots are in sixes. Yeah. Whereas in most of the dicots, you've got three or five or multiple. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. I think that is important in terms of the numbers for the tepals. But um, by looking, I mean, I agree, I know it's very confusing just to look at them unless you already know. It's hard to tell, isn't it? That's the thing. But thank you, that was really helpful. Okay, so now we're going to look at the female part. You've seen this one already um, quite a lot. Oh, am I going back here? No. Oh no, that's all. Yeah, sorry. I want to just go back to the speed about to show you again um, the female part, which is that lovely little stigma, very long style, and the ovary. Now, there's so much variation in these carpels. There's just one carpel here. And um, look how um, rough the stigma is. And that will allow the pollen tube to swell up from the sugary solution. The tube will grow down to the ovary and fertilize the ovule. Now, this one is um, a poppy out of my garden, and I've just put it in to show you how different the stigma is there, and this very short uh, style and the ovaries inside here, surrounded by all of these um, stamens. And again, you see, because it's a, a poppy, it's got its sepals there, but it's lost them here. So the very sh short, fat, structure um but obviously poppies are very successful and making their seeds so it works for them i wonder if you recognize this flower um anyone this is the um you can see here this is a five lobed stigma and the it's hard to show the the, the stigmas sorry, five lobed styles and stigmas here and the ovaries at the base. I think I've got another photograph of it. I haven't. So that's um, thrift, which grows on the Calaminarian metalliferous sites. And this is a geranium, which has got a really fascinating um, arrangement in its carpal. I mean, I actually hadn't appreciated how complicated it was. Um, it has fruits called schizocarps, but um, we're really interested in how the carpels are arranged. And you've got a ring of carpels at the base here, and the styles are all fused together, and then the stamens are at the top. And what happens is that when the flower has been fertilized, oh, sorry. The, this is the stigma here, and these are the, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get my cursor on the thing. These are the styles that have curled back down. Sorry, oh, there it is. So these here were, were all up here. They've curled back off around the base. There's the top of the stigma. And you end up in the fruit with what's this kind of ring of, this is the shizocarp, the base here, 
and then the remains of the, the central part of the, the where all the, the styles were attached. And apparently, and again, Margaret might know this, I didn't know this, but when these seeds shoot out from here into the ground with these coil styles attached, apparently the style acts like a clock and turns and takes the seed further into the ground, which um, we can maybe talk about a little bit at the end of this session section. So that's a geranium and um, showing its rather complex dispersal mechanism as well. Now, the, some, many of you will know that the primroses and all the primula family, this is one of the uh, cultivated primulas out of my garden, have two types of uh, carpal. One with a very long style and a stigma, and here with a very short style and stigma, which isn't very clear on that. I've got a bit of drawing, I think, in a minute. But basically, um, you've got the anthers around here and the stigma down here in this one, and it's at the top, and the anthers are lower down. I'll show you. I've got a better photograph further on, actually, which I'll... Basically, in the Primula family, you've got two types of carpal, one with an ovary, a long style, a stigma, and one with... Um, and the anthers right low down, and a one with the anthers high up, and a long, sorry, a short stigma style and over a short carpal, which isn't very clear. I've got a better photograph I'll show you in a minute. So two types of carpal, because I didn't explain that very well. We've got the um, ovary long style and stigma. That's why it's called a pain flower. And then the thrum flower has the anthers around the outside and a short stigma at the base. And I'll, I've got some more photographs of that in a minute. I don't know why I've taken them out, actually, but I'll show you some. And then you've got the broom flower showing the stigma coiled up here. So that's coiled around. It goes right down to the base in there. And of course, that'll form a long pea pod, the broom, you know, like a broom pod when it's mature. And I've taken it out there to show the, this is, oh, sorry, the, um, long style here, and this here will become the pod. Just like a pea pod, but for brooms and gorse and things like that, it's very similar. Yeah, that's a better, uh, that shows the pin, pin flower. There's the anthers, and there's the um, stigma style and ovary. And that shows thrum. I, I don't think I have very good thrum, thrum photographs here, but, um, yeah, that's very good either. That shows another thrum one. Oh, that's better. There's a, there's a pin, thrum. Sorry, let's go back. Right, that's pin, stigma, long style, uh, ovary, long style, stigma. And then thrum has got tiny ovary style and stigma and the anthers are at the top. Now this is all about pollination um, and ensuring that they don't self-pollinate and that they ensure cross-pollination when the visiting insects come on to the flower. Um, I might come back to that at the end, but I'm, we'll, let's go on for the minute and finish this flower structures. And then maybe if we'll have time, we'll come back to that. Um, this is a tulip flower. This is again, one of the monocots. Um, so it's got tepals here and here's the very broad trilobed stigma short style and this ovary at the bottom here. And this is a crocus, which has a three lobed stigma, yeah, which goes down into the style here. And these are the anthers around it. Ooh. So just showing you the variation really you get. And these are, I've tried to put things in you can see now. So your homework is to, homework is to go out and have a look at some of these flowers. Um, this isn't out now, I just put it in because um, we're looking at a few flowers now in total, in their total structure. So is there anything about carpels and before we leave them? And then I'll just look at some flowers in general that show, you know, all sorts of different parts of the flower on, rather than just concentrating on one 
part. So everybody okay with carpels? Um, so this is ivy flower, which is tiny and um, very reduced flower. And this is its ovary, stigma and style here. And these are the anthers around the outside. So it's, you know, flowers very late autumn and um, supplies nectar when lots of other flowers have gone by and for late insects. It's lovely little flower, the ivy. Now this one I put in because um, half the fact it's a lovely looking flower. It's got hairy stigmas, so they were quite interesting. I don't know why, Margaret might know, I'll ask her at the end. Hairy stigma, sorry, hairy stamens, what am I talking about? Hairy stamens, I think I've, uh, I need to stop for a bit. Hairy stamens and stigma style, yeah. So it's, it's got hairy stamens for some reason, which might be to do with the pollen. I really don't know. That's a Tradescantia plant, by the way. And there's a close up. You see they're very hairy. And yeah, I think, we'll leave, I think we've seen that already, really. And just one or two flowers. That, um, this is the starry saxifrage. Again, another little white flower, but different from the ones we've looked at. Different shaped petal, different shaped ovary in the middle. And of course, the leaves are different. Starry saxifrage. And of course, this is one of the rarities on, in Upper Teesdale. This is the um, Jarber and Corner, Hori Whitlow grass. Just looking at its quite simple structure. It's in the cabbage family. And of course, our lovely gentian. And here you see this tube. See the sepal tubes fused, petal tubes fused, but the last part of the petal is free. And this is the um, water, the um, Dryas octopetala, Mountain Avon, member of the rose family. And that is um, the mountain, forget me not, my sort of alpestris, which lives right up on the tops of the fells. Um, interesting thing about the forget me nots is they've got these little scales around the rim of the petal tube, which I've, there's various reasons why I've read why they're there for insects to attack, you know, to balance on and uh, as it's going down, but I don't really know for sure why they've got those scales or furry bits around the rings in the forest family. But this, they're rather pretty, these little yellow, rough, raised parts on the neck, the throat of the flower. And there's the um, Portantella, Futicosa, another plant, Rose, member of the rose family. And again, you can see the petals there, ring of uh, stamens. And this plant will have epi, sorry, that's the rock rose as well there, I think. Yeah, it is. That will have epicepals on it, which um, I can't see in any of the photographs. So I've got two Portantilla fruticosas and a rock rose there. Sorry. And there to end with is Viola, Lutea, the mountain, uh, the mountain pansy, Viola, Viola lutea, which has a zygomorphic flower, nectar guides, and a rather interesting arrangement of flower there. And I think we'll stop there. Um, has anybody got any questions? Oh, Richard's got one now on rushes. Um, shall we stop sharing or shall I keep the screen up? Uh, it's probably best to leave it up because if people okay. ask questions about anything, then you may need to go back. Okay. I don't think tebbles and rushes are different, Richard, because they're part of the same big group, aren't they? Um, would you, Mark, okay? Yeah. Would, would you like to have said something about a dandelion? Uh, I'm doing that next week. You'll do that another time, right? I'm going to do the, I'm doing the dandy, the Aster family, the Daisy family next week. Okay. Um, okay. Because they're quite complicated. It's a good question because um, they're so different from the other families, which is why I'm doing them separately next week. Thanks, Liz. Okay. Any more questions? Have I flowered you to death? 
<laughs> Shall we stop sharing? Uh, looks like it. Um, yeah. Okay. Tada! Tada! Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hang on a minute, Margaret. I've lost you. Trish. Yeah. Yes, Margaret. Trish. Just a minute. Hang on a minute. Can I, I just remind everybody that? Uh, Lizzie will give it my D session next week, but the week after, we've got Tom Ledhill, chairman of the Teasdale Special Trust, mm -hmm. Special Flora Trust, and Tom will be giving the last of the winter sessions. So please don't forget this. Mm -hmm. Tom will follow Lizzie next week. Lizzie next week, Tom the week after. Margaret, um, Richard just put a question up about the tepals in rushes. And he's asking, are they any different to other tepals? I wouldn't have said they are, would you? I think, can I come in? Yeah, yeah, I'll I'm asking you. I just can't see the screen probably. Rushes are a the cot. Yeah. They've got their parts in threes. And as far as I know, you've got two mm -hmm. worlds of three, which mm -hmm. in some rush flowers look similar, in some they look slightly different. In most of them, they're brownish in colour rather than green. There's some in which they're, they're almost um, cream coloured, but mostly brown, sometimes brown, two shades of brown. But as far as I know, they are just um, two worlds of three perianth structures. Yes, I would agree with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Margaret. Um, Margaret, do you know anything about these, um, you know, the geranium, how the, the, sh the Shizor carp in the geranium, when it splits, apparently I was reading that the, um, the, st the curved style acts like a, it, it turns into the soil and spins the seed into the soil, which I've never come across before. Do you know anything about that? What was that, Lizzie? You know the you know in the geranium the shizor carp when the when the um when the fruit when the styles turn back mm -hmm. and spring the fruit out of the yes. um and it goes into the ground apparently the what? styles act like a turn like a clock and spin the seed into the ground the carp is into the ground I'd, I've never come across that. Well, as far as I know, in the stalks build. And the geraniums in this country, I thought that they they were just like catapults and they threw yeah. the seeds out. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then. Well, maybe it was just this old, but I found it in an old botany book and I was just wondering uh, what, what it meant. <laughs> Can we stop I'd like to come back with primulas. Mm -hmm. You talked about the pins of the thrum ones. Yeah. Uh, the, the surface of the stigma is different in each of those, and the size of the pollen is different. Mm -hmm. And although I can't just remember which is which, um, one, of, one of the stigmas has got um, has got so short, um, oh, they're not hairs, but it's quite thick. It's almost as if it has hairs. And the pollen from the other one um, can sit on it and go down in between these fibrils. The oh. other one has got an old, almost but not quite smooth surface. And large pollen 
Ah, the the small collar can can attach itself to the larger stigma. Uh, in the other <laughs> one, the small pollen can. I'm not explaining this one very well. The small pollen can sit on the smoother surface. Um, the big pollen can't. Yes. And what happens is that you can get hybrids resulting, pollination resulting in one direction with one lot of pollen, but the other lot of pollen can pollinate flowers of both pig nice. and thrum. Oh, okay. It, it's, it, it's very, <laughs> it's very interesting. It's a bit complicated. It's very interesting. Quite a lot of work was done by one of the staff of Durham University, and it results in um, interesting genetic genetic uh, study. Yeah. I'll see if I can find some diagrams that would help you with that now. Get Trish to send them round. That would be very interesting. It's a long, long time since <laughs> I did this. <laughs> well, you never know, they might just turn up. That would be great. So, really helpful. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we stop sharing? <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, any last questions from anybody before we stop? How do I? Yeah. No, you, you can also pick up John Richard's book on eBay um, on Primula, which has got mm -hmm. lots on 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 stopping selfing. And it's um, but the the books, oh, it's less than ten pounds on eBay, or I, I think I got it for five pounds uh, mm -hmm. delivered. So it's a great big comb. Yeah. But yeah, lots of stuff on the on on the mechanisms of stopping selfing in primulas in there. Well, he's a real expert, isn't he, on that? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I know there was a lot. Of, uh, please don't try and take it all in if you're a beginner. I was trying <laughs> to sort of accommodate everybody. <laughs> so obviously the first part was the part you should really concentrate on when you're learning about the flower structure. <laughs> but because so many people have been on for a long time and we always get Margaret's magic gems to, mm -hmm. we've got tonight on the um, primulas and things, which is always great to have. I keep meaning to write them all down where you should. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, are we finished then for tonight? Yeah. Any more questions? Right, you